Mummification wasn't limited to ancient Egypt. This practice has been recorded in numerous parts of the world, including the south of Sweden, where, in the 1600s, Bishop Peter Winstrup was preserved. Archaeologists gained major historical insights when they later studied his corpse, but they got more than they bargained for when they looked between his feet. 17th century bishops' remains solve an ancient mystery. In Sweden, a group of Lund Cathedral officials exhumed Peter's body because they wanted to move him to a new location. During the transfer, researchers seized the chance to X-ray and CT scan the bishop's remains. The team discovered Peter was mummified and laid to rest on a fragrant herbal spread. Lemon balm, hyssop, juniper, and other aromatic plants were spread under Peter. Besides covering the odor of his decaying body, the plants may have prevented the onset of decay. The archaeological team isn't completely sure of the process used to mummify Peter. They suspected he was stored in a cool, ventilated room after dying. In life, Peter was one of the founders of Lund University, which is currently ranked as one of the top 100 schools internationally. The school started educating students in 1666. Besides his work with the college, he was a scientist, theologian, avid collector, and scholar. Peter was named a bishop in 1638, keeping his position even when the region switched from Danish rulers to Swedes instead. He died in 1679. Thanks to the new body scans, researchers now know Peter suffered from gout, arthritis, gallstones, tuberculosis, and pneumonia. The gallbladder also has several gallstones, which could indicate a high consumption of fatty food project osteologist Carolyn Alström Arsini said. Peter's high-ranking church position meant he had plenty of wealth, which gave him access to sugar and other kinds of unhealthy foods. Peter's love of sugar cost him most of his teeth. He was also suffering from a shoulder injury and would have had problems maneuvering to do tasks like brushing his hair and washing himself. The man definitely had a poor quality of life in his later years. When he succumbed to pneumonia in 1679, it may have been a relief, partially. Examining his body helped researchers better understand the 17th century Lund society. This founding father, in one way, still lives, still contributes to modern society, through his coffin, through his body per Karsten, pictured, director of the Lund University Historical Museum, said. It's a mini-universe of the 17th century. With deepest respect, he is a unique medical archive that we can return to, over and over again, to ask new questions per said and he will have the answer. Now that the archaeologists are finished with their research, Peter has been interred in a new metal coffin. Peter's new resting place is behind the Lund Cathedral's enormous medieval-era astronomical clock, which emits a clangorous bell song at the top of every hour. If that doesn't wake you up, to hear the alarming bells per said. It's very disturbing for a bishop's final resting place. Peter's legacy is so enmeshed with the cathedrals that he does deserve a place among its Romanesque towers. The building was constructed in the 12th century and remained intact even when the Swedes took the area from the Danish in 1658. Like the building, Peter also remained to keep his position under the new leadership. He was very practical and thought, OK, so now we're Swedish, how can we benefit? Per said. Why not start a university in Lund, so that the city itself, the province, would prosper whether it was Danish or Swedish? I think he is a role model of a practical politician who's trying to make the best for himself and for the city. Though Peter was a Protestant bishop, he didn't let his faith get in the way of his interest in science. His true passion was natural science, but he also was an early believer in medicine. When Peter assisted with the college opening, he insisted that medical classes be a part of the curriculum. I think he would smile if he knew about the interest in him now per said. Besides being alive during an interesting section of Swedish history, there was another reason the scientists wanted to study the bishop he wasn't buried alone. Between Peter's shins, there was an intriguing specimen. A five or six month old human fetus. At first, no one was sure who sired this mystery baby. The prevailing theory was that a servant may have hidden the body in the coffin. After testing a sample of each's DNA, the team got a result it had not anticipated. I was not expecting to see that they would be related Maja Kruinska, left, a biologist at Stockholm's Center for Paleogenetics, said. With some digging, 
The most likely father of the fetus was Peter Pedersen Winstrup, Peter Sr.'s only son who survived to adulthood. Pers dug deeper into the results. Pers was also a major servant fetus believer and thought the results are absolutely beautiful in every way beautiful because I was wrong. I really love when science comes into play like that. You have one theory and new analysis proves that you're wrong and you have to think in another way. Still, the mystery wasn't completely solved. Though they know who the fetus belonged to, researchers still aren't sure who placed it with the bishop. This is fairly common in Scandinavia in medieval times, where we see multiple burials of adults with children. And we don't know why that is Maja said. She plans to find out, however. I'm looking to see what's the relation between the grown-ups and the children Maja said. No one has ever looked at that, because only now do we have the tools. There's one theory about why the two were buried together. The culprit may have hoped the bishop would guide the fetus to the afterlife. By concealing the fetus, you make a statement that maybe it isn't totally okay, but you do it to get the best chance for the soul of this unbaptized child to have a place on God's right side per said. I find it very human. When they moved Peter, they kept his grandson alongside him. Of course, we placed the fetus with the bishop per said. They belong together. The two will continue their eternal rest behind the powerful cathedral clock hopefully not too disturbed by the tolling of the bells. Even though researchers were lucky enough to find answers to this case, there are other incidents that go far beyond Peter and the fetus, some of which the Catholic Church would soon rather forget. The Catholic Church has suffered its fair share of public controversies, but there's one incident that seems unthinkable by modern standards. In the Italian city of Bologna, the Papal States actually carried out the abduction of a child. Making a move that was fiercely defended by the Pope, the church went toe-to-toe -to -toe with loving parents who wouldn't back down. The papal carabinieri police arrived at doorstep of Salomon Mamolo Mortara and his wife Mariana on June 23, 1858. As the lead marshal gravely explained to the father of eight, Signor Mortara, I am sorry to inform you that you are the victim of a betrayal. The reason for the military police's presence caught both parents off guard. Their worst nightmare was realized when they were told that their six-year-old son Ejardo was being taken away from them because he'd been secretly baptized. Despite their pleas, the officers wouldn't divulge where they'd gotten their information. However, this wasn't an unheard of circumstance. Jewish families living under the rule of the papal state were wary of attempts to baptize their children without their permission. As a minority group in Bologna, Jewish families like the Mortaras sometimes employed Christian maids. Since unconsenting baptisms of Jewish children were commonplace, some parents had made sign notarized statements ensuring they hadn't done so. The Mortaras were more trusting with their maids. Even still, the news that their little boy was being snatched from them while they had no say in the matter was earth-shattering. They knew they had little power to change the ruling of papal law. At the time, it was considered illegal by the Papal States for a person of a different faith to raise a Christian child. When they learned about Ajardo's secret baptism, the Holy Office decided to take action. The congregation decided the child must be taken away from his family. Yep, you read that correctly. The Papal State ordered the six-year-old to be stripped from his parents and raised under the control of the church. As it turned out, a maid who worked for the Mortaras for six years, Anna Marissi, confessed to baptizing a very sick baby Ajardo, fearing the child was going to die. While the severity of baby Ajardo's condition remains up for debate, it was confirmed that Anna Marissi spoke to at least a few people about the event. Eventually, the rumor of a child baptized by his Christian mate eventually reached the inquisitor of Bologna, Father Pier Filetti. With permission from the Holy Office, Filetti brought Anna Marissi to the Basilica of St. Dominic for questioning. There, she admitted her deed, though she later regretted her role in Ajardo's trajectory, figuring that it was all my fault, I was very unhappy, and still am. The papal carabinieri allowed the Mortara family one day to plea with every high-ranking contact they had to get the decision overturned, but it proved futile. Not knowing where Ajardo was headed, Mamolo fainted after his son was pulled from his arms. During this period, the Pope was Pius IX. 
he was originally tapped as a potential game-changer for the church, but his opposition to the unification of Italy made him widely unpopular. Initially, he wasn't involved in the decision to kidnap Ajardo Mortara. Family sources said that losing her son broke Mariana mentally. Mamolo, after he learned of Ajardo's whereabouts, maintained his courage for the few chaperoned visits he was allowed with Ajardo. The rest of his energy was devoted to fighting back against the church. The Papal States encouraged the narrative that the boy was a quick-learning devoted Catholic who wished for nothing more than for both his parents to give up their Jewish faith and convert to Christianity, a position that left many unconvinced. Word of the Papal State's abduction of a Jewish child in Bologna traveled quickly, and it was met with a glaringly negative reaction. Protests broke out. Beyond the response of the Jewish community, many westernized publications, like the New York Times, called for Ijardo's return. Pope Pius IX was not prepared for the negative global publicity. In his yearly meeting with members from Rome's Jewish community, things grew tense. It led to the Pope blurting out, the newspapers can write all they want. I couldn't care less what the world thinks. As the head of the Holy Office, Pope Pius IX was still the final decision maker, even if he hadn't ordered the kidnapping himself. Plus, he'd formed a very close personal bond with Ajardo and made his position on his return very clear. As quoted in Ajardo's memoir, the Pope said, both the powerful and the powerless tried to steal this boy from me and accused me of being barbarous and pitiless. They cried for his parents, but they failed to recognize that I, too, am his father. A year later, Father Pier Filetti was arrested orchestrating the kidnapping at the Basilica of San Domenico. An investigation and subsequent trial were complicated by Filetti's lack of cooperation and the inconsistency of Marissi's story, which led to his acquittal. War and Italian unification subsequently resulted in a lot of upheaval for the Catholic Church, but young Ajardo remained their ward. Years of indoctrination by Christianity created a rift between him and his family, and the 19-year-old refused to return to them when Rome fell. For many, this tragic story showed the division between modern society and the values of the Catholic Church. It's looked at today with shame, an embarrassing violation of power wrapped in anti-Semitic arguments. The justification of Ajardo's kidnapping wasn't in line with Christian values. Many heroes within the Catholic Church have stood their ground in opposition to those trying to do harm in the Church's name. Thanks for watching, and don't forget to like and subscribe.